about that we miss him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this family. Thank you for this gathering. Um, thank you, Lord, for um, your word to us every week. We are so grateful. And we pray that you would help us, no matter what is going on in our lives, the busyness of whatever season of life we are in, that we would not miss you, Lord, when you speak to us in your still and quiet voice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've, I've, I have only got one other little notice today, and that is to encourage all ladies, if you've not read the notices that are sent by email, that there's this amazing event that you shouldn't miss, Women's Together, on Wednesday the 25th of May at 12 noon at the Flat Rock Bistro, lovely place, and there's actually a contribution towards the lunch, so um, you won't have to cover the whole cost yourself. So if you are interested, it's Arlene or Margaret to, to let know. So it's 25th of May, there is still sign, time to sign up. Come if you can. Now we've got Carwin leading us in prayer today, and many of you may know Carwin, and I didn't. I thought, ooh, Carwin. So I, I went and had a little chat to Arlene, and do you know how the Welsh always call people by their profession or where they live or some peculiar um, characteristic? She went, he's a farmer, Carwin the farmer. <laughs> so we're welcoming Carwin the farmer, and I thought there may be a few others who don't know Carwin. Um, but he is originally from Aberkeek, so around here, went away to study, I forgot already where that was, Edinburgh? Manchester. Manchester. But did something after that in Edinburgh? Did you? Where? Oh, so then worked away. So he's been um, up north, as it were, for a while. But he, he's back in Wales, and he started to join us um, and our services when we reopened back in whenever that was. Um, so welcome so much, Carwin, and we are grateful for you leading us in prayer today. He got collared by Arlene. Um, <laughs> during our main time of singing and worship together, there will be a collection. Uh, I think that's all I need to tell you now, other than we have our lovely brother, Jim English, bringing God's message to us today. Thank you, Jim. But we can now have our first worship um, thank you, Ken and Steve. It's been a long time since I've done this, and I've got a bit of hay fever. So if, forgive me if I do cough a little bit, but I'll move away from the microphone. But it's not about me, it's about worshipping our God together. We're here to worship God. We're here to give him all the glory, all of the praise. And as we sing, we can do that together. It's one of the only times we can do that together, isn't it? Praise God together one voice. So let's stand, let's behold our God together. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Farmer Carwin. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, having me up for leading the prayer today. Um, I was just wondering as well, there, there might be a few of us uh, here today who um, maybe it's your first time coming here or uh, you've been coming for a little bit and you're not quite sure what prayer is or you just need a little bit of a reminder or something like that. And quite simply, all it is is the way that we communicate and spend time with God. When we seek to draw closer to somebody, um, we naturally talk to them more, or we spend more time with them, be that through verbally or sign language or letters or texting or memes or pictures of funny cats. And well, the end goal in the end then is that you draw closer to the person that you're talking to, and with us, that's God. And so when we pray, you might ask now, well, what do you pray about? And the answer is absolutely everything including if you want pictures of funny cats. Um, so, but it's so much more deeper than that as well. You can talk to God about your troubles. You can talk to God about what you're grateful for. You can talk to God about your day. You can talk about God, what you want to see happen as well. You can petition to him. And so in a second, I'm going to just start leading. And if you're not sure how to do that, then just in your head, just follow along. And then, you know, Say the same things. And when you go home today, I just ask you to sit down for two minutes and repeat it again if you can remember it, or add your own stuff, or you know, take it where you feel like you want it to go. But just two minutes, and then maybe at the end of the gate day, do it again, and tomorrow, try it again. And just keep spending time with God to draw closer to him in prayer, and just really strengthen that bond and that relationship. So if you want to just by your heads or hands together or whatever's comfortable for you guys. Yeah, Lord God, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you so much for this open space where we can come and praise and worship you, Lord. There are so many in the world who struggle to find the place to do that or find the safety to do that, Lord, or even be able to do it in the comfort of their own homes, Lord. And we just pray for this family in Ukraine, who we hope will join us soon, that all their paperwork will go through. Father, they sound like they're going to be an incredible bunch, and although I've completely forgotten their names, they're really interesting. And Lord, we just pray that we get to see them, and that we can make them safe here, and all the other families that are seeking refuge as well, Lord. Lord, I want to ask that you fertilize the fruits of the Spirit in this church, Lord. Love, joy, peace, thankfulness, all of them, Lord. That they would grow tenfold in this place so much so that we can't carry them and we have to give them away. That they will be given out onto the streets, Lord. That people will see this, take from this, eat from this, Lord, and want to know more. Want to come here and find out what you're about, Lord. That we can turn all this fruit back to you in great and glorious praise, Lord. Father, we pray for the message today, that your spirit would be in it, that you would speak through Jim today in the word. Lord, would you humble us today with whatever it is you want to tell us? Lord, would we leave here changed people raving about you, Lord? Will we turn it into praise again, Lord? Will we draw closer to you, Lord? Would we be changed? Father and God, and I just pray that we can draw closer together in the community that we are here. That be that two or three of us on the weekend, be that our families, or just when we're on our own in peaceful time with you, Lord. We just pray a challenge that you would enter into our lives and get to know us better so that we can get to know you better. Father, I thank you so much for everything, Lord. And thank you for the ability to worship you too. Amen. I don't know what um, Jim's going to say, but I think this next song is going to probably fit in with what he's going to say. So. 
Let's uh, praise God together again. Stand, sit, you know, whatever you feel comfortable doing, doing um, as we worship God together with these next three songs. <laughs>
just want to thank God for the offering. Lord, thank you so much as we have just sung. We come to you with a grateful heart, Lord, for all your provision. I love that one of your names in the Bible is that you are our provider. And Lord, we have given back in different ways. And, and here we are giving our money, Lord, and we ask for your blessing upon it. Ask that it will serve your purposes in small ways and in big ways, Lord. And ask that your name would be glorified, that people would be drawn to you to have, as we have been hearing, a relationship with you, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sue. Sue mentioned earlier that our friend who just prayed for us, Karen, that Arlene had collared him. So it must run in the family because Mark collared me this morning to preach. Whether to good or to bad, I'll make that up to you. But it's a privilege to stand and give God's word this morning. It's great to be with you. Scripture reading come up with the screen, but it's taken from Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 to 31. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, Will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this, 
but they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. Shall we pray? Lord, we give you thanks for your word this morning. We thank we can open it, Lord, without any fear of repercussions. We thank you still for this way that we can talk to you, speak about you, tell people what a great Savior you are. This morning we would ask, Lord, that no man may be seen up this but you, Lord, that your words may be my words, that, Lord, your name may be glorified, because we give you all the honor, we give you all the glory, because it's due to your wonderful and marvelous name. Amen. Amen. The text that I would like to look at, only a few words, but has tremendous meaning. 28 verse of that chapter 9, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Of all the great questions asked in the New Testament, there is perhaps none greater than asked by our Lord and recorded for us in our text. Believe ye that I'm able to do this. This question introduces the theme I would like to concentrate on this morning for a short while. When we think of all the wonderful things that Christ is able to do in us, with us, through us, and all those who put their trust in him. We have the scene of the story that was told in Matthew there where Jesus was returning from the ruler's house back to his lodgings. He had just gone to the ruler's house and he'd healed that young lad of the evil spirit. And as he was going along the road, there was these two blind beggars shouting after him. They were following with these incessant cries. Beggars in biblical days were the media and the communication channels like we have our local radio and our local television. Obviously, they would be begging on their main routes going from village to village, from city to city. They knew of the tremendous miracles that Jesus had carried out. But more important to them, they knew that he had made the blind to see. Although the crowd tried to quell their noise, they tried to stop them, they cried out all the more, have mercy on us, son of David, they cried. This title, which these men gave to Christ, was well known to the promise that God had given to David that the Messiah would come from the descendants of David as recorded in Isaiah. At this time, when Jesus was walking the earth, there was a great and general expectation of his appearing. These blend men knew it. They owned it. And they proclaimed it in the streets of Capernaum. They heard of what happened in other cities, other villages. That he has come, and this is he. Jesus' ability to give the sight to the blind men was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 18. Right back there in the Old Testament. And it says this. In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll... And out of the gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. I think I'm... I'll put that over there a minute. So it was prophesied back there, and they knew it. It would seem that Jesus didn't hear their cries. Because Jesus didn't respond immediately to the blind man's plea. He had waited till he had gone indoors... I believe he was testing their faith to see if they had enough faith to believe that he could do it. The important thing for us to notice is that Jesus, when he asked them whether they believed he was able to give them the sight, and when he performed the great miracle, he said to them, according to your faith, will it be done to you? We cannot, we must not divorce the statement from the Lord's question. They go in hand in hand, as we would say, for two must go together. For, Christ, for while Christ is able 
are perfectly able to do certain things for us. Our faith must be operative if we are to prove his ability in our lives. Therefore, he is able to do certain wonderful things for us, but we must trust him to do them. And the measure of our trust will determine the measure of our experience of his ability. The trust can be stated in the following ways. Quite simply, he is able, according to your faith, and according to my faith. I learned a tremendous lesson about faith. Although it was in a non-spiritual situation, it put me in good stead for my spiritual life. On my 40th birthday, five years ago, <laughs> my PA secretary then arranged me to have a parachute jump from Swansea. So the day came, it was a Saturday, and we went down as a family to Swansea, but I couldn't understand why for five hours we had to do training for a three-minute flight. Couldn't understand this. So he goes down there, and we goes into this hangar, and there's a mock-up of a side of a plane, and the three other people who were jumping at the same time as me, we had to get inside the plane, and we jump out, and we go... 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, check canopy. No, it was a laugh. There's a bit of banter. But the instructor or the jump master, he was called, would say, stop it. If you don't do what I say, you'll end up in death. So all through the training session, he said, if you don't do this, we have to repeat like parrots, death. So the five hours of training, jump at the side of this mocker plane. So it came to lunchtime, and we went over to the runway, and there was this black shed on wheels. Couldn't describe it, in other words. And I thought to myself, do I really want to do this? <laughs> and as he opened the side doors, there was nothing in it. No insulation, no seats, apart from one for the pilot, thank goodness, and, <laughs> and one for the jump master. But it was just aluminium floors. So after lunch, we put on our gear, our overalls, and our parachute and our emergency chute. Goes over to the plane. This time, there's no side to the plane. They take the doors off. So I asked the jump master in my infantile ignorance, where's the doors? Oh, we don't have doors when we go up in the sky, he said. So my apprehension was even worse now. And my legs started to shake a bit. I think it was the cold. <laughs> so we jumped into the plane and we were astride each other. And my secretary's son was jumping with me. He was first. So we started to climb. And although I did centrifugal force when I did my qualification, when you're at 45 degrees angle and you're next to open side of a plane and the only thing you can see is the ground, You've got to remind yourself that you're sticking to the floor. Now my right leg is really shrimbling a bit, thinking, Lord, what have I done? So we get up to the top, three and a half thousand feet, and the green light comes on, and the jump master said, Chris, go. He's sitting on the side of the plane by now. Chris, go. Chris, too late, and he shoved him. And there was quite a number of explosives coming down. You could hear him coming down. So they circled and it was my turn. And I thought, he ain't going to push me. I'm going to close my eyes and jump. So he said, Jim, it's your turn to jump. So I got inside the plane. Green light came up. Jump, Jim. Closed my eyes, jumped up. Jumped out. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, check canopy. My parachute hadn't opened. I passed Chris on the way down. And you had a one-way radio from ground to you. I could see why. And the guy on the ground said, sitting, standing next to Ross, says, your parachute hasn't opened. I said, you don't have to tell me that. He can't hear me. <laughs> he said, you know what to do? I looked up, and my risers, that's the cords connected, are tangled. It's called Roman candled. But you've got to determine which way they tangled. Looked at my altimeter. I'm now down to 1,500 feet. I dropped 1,500 feet like a stone. He said, you know the process? Once you get to 1,000 feet, get rid of your chute 
and open your emergency. This chute should have opened on its own because it was connected to a cable. And it was a canopy, not a round one. But it didn't. So I looked up and they were tangled clockwise. So I had to kick anti-clockwise and smack on a thousand feet with this guy shouting at me, you know what to do, get rid of your chute if you hit a thousand feet. But smack on a thousand feet, it opened. By this time now, I'm away from the airfield because they drop down because when they drop you, the wind takes you. But it was an incredible experience. After that, you pull on your right and you go right, you pull on your left, and he was guiding me back to the airfield. It was like a bird. It was exhilaration. And then we seen the cross in the field, and then you come down 100 feet, 60 feet, 40 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. Then you close your chute when you're about three feet, and you step off. Brilliant outcome. You may say, what's that to do with faith? Taught me a lot. Don't understand what's going on. Terrible situation. But I had the faith in that jump master. Unfortunately, a month later, they took parachute jump from Swansea because a guy who happened the same as me fell to his death because he didn't have faith in the jump master. I feel that we need to remind ourselves this morning what the Lord's able to do for us. And there's no better place to turn to get the answer than to scriptures. In Hebrews 7.25, we learn that he's able to save us to the utmost. We must trust him to do this, for we'll do it according to our faith. I've been mentioned that quite often through this short message. Nothing can alter the fact that he's able to save them that come to God by him. But what about our actual experience of his saving ability depends on our coming into God by him. Many ways to Jesus, only one way to God. A friend of mine I was speaking to last week, in his 90s now, we were calling his testimony, although he was losing it a little bit, he was saved in the bath. His wife was in the prayer meeting downstairs in their house, and he was trying to get away from it, but the Lord met him in the bath. Many ways to Jesus, only one way to God. Can we truly say this morning, as a lovely hymn, old hymn, I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee, trusting thee for full salvation, great and free. Acts 4.12 says, Jesus Christ is the only saviour. But the great question we have to ask ourselves this morning, is he your saviour? And more than this, how much is he your saviour? Because the important word in Hebrews 25 is the word utmost, which means completely, perfectly. Some people are saved from the guilt and penalty of their sin, but they're not saved from worry, from fear, from doubt. Some are saved from hell, but not from the untamed tongue. Some are saved from condemnation, but not from criticism. I praise God this morning that the Lord Jesus is able to save us completely from sin, from self, and from Satan. And we must trust him to do it. For again, it's according to our faith. We experience the power of the saving grace in our lives. Secondly, in Hebrews 2, 18, 18, we learn that he's able to help those who are tempted. We must trust him. To do this, for again, it's according to our faith. Temptation itself is not sin. We're all tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. But it's only when we yield to that temptation that we fall into sin. How can we then resist and overcome temptation when we feel it's too heavy to bear? The complete verse... I just read, says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who have been tempted, who are being tempted. And if we link that up with Hebrews 4.15, it's really telling us the Lord Jesus, having travelled this pathway before us, is qualified 
to sympathize with us. In addition, he's able to help us when we are tempted. How thankful we should be that no temptation need be too great for us to bear. Not my words. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. The Lord is able to deliver us every time we are tempted. Didn't say it was going to be easy. We wouldn't have to have faith. It's going to be easy. But in order to prove his delivery power, we have to trust him and rely upon him. For once again, it's according to our faith that we'll experience that delivering power in our lives. Thirdly, only two more to go. Although there are many others, time doesn't give us that opportunity. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, we learn that he's able to sustain us in the midst of trials, problems. For he will do it according to our faith. When we are pressed with these problems, these trials that we don't understand, we can react in several different ways. First of all, we can complain, we can grumble, we can murmur. But what does that achieve? Does it glorify God? No, never glorifies God. Does it glorify the Lord? No. And it can never help us or anybody else. We can be filled with self-pity, which means simply that we feel very sorry for ourselves. I want everybody else around us to feel sorry also. Does that glorify God? Does that help us? No. We can become bitter. We can even question the wisdom and the will and the ways of God. And we can feel resentful that we should allow trials to fall upon us. We can lose faith altogether. We can ask the question, does God care? We can go under and be completely overwhelmed with the pressure of the trial that has come upon us. But praise God this morning, friends. These reactions are not necessary. For the Lord is able to sustain us, not once, always, by and with his grace. If we need to be reminded, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Lord Jesus is well able to sustain us every time of trial and testing comes. But we have to do our part. We have to trust him. Because it, it happened because it's according to our faith. And we'll experience his sustaining grace in our lives. Fourthly, in Ephesians 3.20, it tells us when we pray, the Lord is able to do far more than we ever dare ask or imagine. I don't know about you, but imagination runs wild sometimes with me. I'm a fly fisherman, and I always imagine being on a, a lake or a river with all the fish rising and me catching them. Or most often not, it's the reverse. They're not rising, I'm not catching anything. But the Lord said, and in his word, he could do far more than we could ever ask or imagine. There's no doubt about the ability to hear and answer prayer. But the answer we receive depends upon our faith. He's able to do great and mighty things in answer to prayer. Jeremiah 33 says, Call unto me, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. So mentioned Elijah only a few weeks prior. He was on the mountain, the prophets of Baal, where he wanted the Lord to consume the offering. He said, put water on it. Put more water on it. And he prayed to God, and God sent the fire, and it completely consumed the offering. He'll answer. He will hear us. So let us ask him to do these things that we feel that we can't do for ourselves. Ours is the problem. It's our unbelief. Mark 9, 23, 24. We have that account 
where Jesus healed that young boy. And the father asked Jesus, if you can, and it's recorded there where it says, Jesus said, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father explained, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. How often do we limit God by unbelief? Let us therefore act in the future. Let us there ask therefore, and let us ask believing. For once again, it's according to our faith that we should experience his answer to our prayers in our lives. It may not happen immediately, but don't give up. It will in God's time. On July 26, 2015, Ross and I were in Paris. It was our wedding anniversary. And on the night of our anniversary, we were going out, or Ros was looking for somewhere to go out for a meal. Like Ros do, she always researched things to the infinite detail for the best option. She'd been there for three quarters of an hour, looking at these restaurants, looking at prices, looking at the distances. And be honest, I had enough. My patience, I said, Ros, where are we going? Oh, I, if, I said, Ros, I took this directory off. I said, we go in there. It was only about 100 yards from where we were stopping. Ah, oh, but you know the prices? I said, we go in there. So when anniversary. I've not always been that decisive. If you know Ros, you know why. But um, we went around the corner, and there was this little restaurant. Very nice. As we walked in, there's only eight tables. And the manager was dressed like he's come from, as we say, John Taylor's, Taylor shop, and he kissed her on the hand. And Ros says, this looks expensive, this looks posh. I said, Ros, we're going in. So we go in, we sit down, and they give us the menu. She said, there's no prices on my menu. I said, but there is on mine. <laughs> What's the price of this? I said, Ros, it's our anniversary. So we sat there, and I looked frog legs on the menu. I said, I wonder what they're like. And I was conscious there was a couple, an Indonesian couple, next table to us. He said, I can recommend those, he said. I had them last night. So we, we chose our meals. And he, he said to us, um, are you here for business or pleasure? And Ros said, oh, are you here for pleasure? He said, this is the start of our anniversary celebration. It was our 40th wedding anniversary. But in November... To, to match my 60th birthday, I should have said that, Roger, right? Um, we are going on a cruise. And this lady asked, where are you going on a cruise? Or where have you been? She said, our best cruise was to Israel. And she answered said, oh, we got married in Jerusalem. So straight away, you thought, hang on. I said, any particular reason why you got married in Jerusalem? We're born again Christians, she said. And we've just come back from Hill Songs. So it was tremendous. The rest of the evening we were talking in between the food. Sometimes the food went cold, but it didn't matter. And Roz, as she does, she loves the grandkids. We all love grandkids. Pulled out her phone. We only had two at that time. She said, these are our two grandchildren, Poppy and Jakey. She said, Jakey is our miracle baby. I don't know if you remember a few years ago when I spoke on Mother in Sunday, I said about Jakey where his mother, who couldn't have children, the doctor said, wrote a song, The Mother's Song. It's on YouTube, where after seven or eight years, they had little Jakey, he was a miracle baby. And she started to sob. Ayo, her name was, sorry. Ayo started to sob. And Ross said, why are you crying? She said, we've been trying for four years. Ari's husband had major problems. And then Ross gave the story about it was the last time of IVF, and they tried this, and nothing but God intervened. So the Lord seemed to tell me to tell them they don't have a child. And I'm saying, Lord, I've been in the faith a long time. I've never prophesied. And as we were going through, it's a company, tell them you have a child. I said, Lord, are you sure? So at the end, I said, I don't know why, but the Lord is telling me you're going to have a child. So, long story short, came to the end of the night. It was 12 o'clock by now. The restaurant was empty. 
The manager was in the corner yawning and trying to give the, the hint that we need to go. So we went outside and there was the Ark of Tree over to my left and I felt toward to right and the four of us out and we prayed. And we met them again in Singapore when we'd done the cruise back in November. And we prayed and we prayed. Six and a half years we've been praying. Mike, could you put up a photograph? Last month, I'm filling up now, Ayo gave birth to a bouncy little girl called Abby. Six and a half years we've been praying in our house groups. She's over the moon and prior to that, they'd done tremendous work. You wouldn't mind me saying, every year, Harry, he's a businessman, and his, I'll compose myself here, and his um, partner, they take a water system to a remote Africa village every year. God is no man's letter. He can do the things that we cannot do. He can do the imaginable things. Lastly, coming to a close, in June 24, in June 24, we learn that he's able to keep us until we stand glorified in his present. We have to trust him to do this. For again, it's according to our faith. Isn't it tremendous that Jesus is able and he's willing and he guarantees to keep an unworthy sinner just like myself right to journey's end? He will do it because that's the Lord's intention and his will. But we only can experience the assurance of our acceptance by him and the assurance of his keeping power if we trust him. Assurance only comes on our grounds, on our faith in him. Yes, we shall get to heaven, all right, if we accept him as saviour and Lord, and we are faithful because of his faithfulness. But what about our enjoyment of the journey there and our confidence that we shall certainly reach heaven depends upon our faith. It irritates me sometimes when you see somebody who looks great and they said, yes, I'm all right under the circumstances. Paul had that confidence as he wrote in 2 Timothy 1.12 because I've known who I have believed and I'm convinced, not persuaded, I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I have trusted in him until that day. I tried this morning in a simple way to remind us once again of the things that Jesus is able to do in, for, and through all who put their trust in him. Perhaps you were facing a very trying situation. Some problem that seems so great that we feel it cannot be solved. Humanly speaking, there doesn't seem to be any way out. But why do we use the words humanly speaking? We've got a superhuman God. I pray that you would bring God into the situation and to relate that situation to the Lord himself. And the Lord will say to you, like he said to those two blind men, do you believe I may do this? I pray you will say, yes, Lord. And he will say to you, according to your faith, be it unto you. Perhaps there are some among us this morning that have not a God to trust in or a saviour to love. May you seek Jesus now. If you seek him, he will be found. The Bible confirms this in that famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. May God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Jim. That's, that's really encouraging. And um, this last song is, is a reminder of who Jesus is and what he is to us. So let's stand. Let's sing this in confidence. We sing these words together. If you believe in Jesus, you can sing these words in confidence. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age, the earth you will gather the nations before And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who will truly divide. Angels will cry.
and the earth will reply, you shall reign. As a king of all kings and a lord of all There's a shield in our hand and a sword at our side. There's a fire in our spirit that cannot be denied. But the Father has told us, for these you have died. For the nation that gathered before you. And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified. To ascend to hell, yet was raised up. The earth will reply, you shall reign. As the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And the angels will cry, hell the land. Who was slain for the world, rolling down. And the earth will reply, the King of all King and the Lord of all Lord, as the King of all King and the Lord of all Lord, as the King of all King and the Lord of all Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, um, Jim, Ken, Steve. There's a verse on the wall. Um, well, a little passage on our kitchen wall, and I think it kind of encapsulates Jim's message to us. So I'm going to turn that into my benediction. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Amen. We have now got refreshments. I, in case we've got any um, people unfamiliar, they'll come to you rather than you having to go to the refreshments. So you can stay in here or out in the nice sunshine. Thank you all.